All right, can we go, go ahead and get started? Can you guys hear me? Yep, yep, yep. we can start whenever you'd like. Yes. Awesome, okay. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody to Python for Physics. Uh, this is the last lecture of week four, uh, which marks us officially ha at our halfway point. So yay, good job everybody, you made it this far. Um, and I, I figured I would start the same way that I started last time. Um, we wanna hear how you guys are doing. So how are you doing? Uh, where are you coming from? How are things on your part of the world? What is the temperature like? What are you doing when you're not here with us? So why don't you just send us comments? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. We enjoy reading your comments, your positive comments, your um, you know, comments about how you wish things were different. And we try to, you know, I think we try to uh, acknowledge your request and try to change things a little bit uh, after we hear your feedback. So please go ahead and tell us how you're doing in your in the comment box, okay? Um, and, and I'll do the same administrative stuff as before because every single time I show this slide, I get more uh, more emails from you. Uh, they're starting to plateau, which is telling me that all of you are doing a great job at just emailing us. Email this, if you haven't emailed this, uh, if you haven't sent an email to this email account before, go ahead and do that. And what you'll get is an is a auto reply with information for our website, which is this one, uh, information on how to get to the Slack chat. Slack is a platform where we can interact with you uh, and students love it. Uh, we're, you know, you guys are, have been, those of you that are being in the Slack chat, uh, have been doing a really great job of talking to each other, sharing your own code. And in fact, what I'm seeing, which is what we want to see, is that you guys would learn from each other. Uh, ultimately, you're going to learn a lot more from your peers and, you know, trying to push each other and cross check each other. Uh, you're going to learn a lot more from your peers and you're going to learn from us on the faculty. Okay, so go ahead and join this. There's a little bit of caveat that you have to be 16 years old or older. Uh, the live stream is what you're witnessing right now, uh, and then the recordings, everything that you're seeing is recorded, and we're going to leave it there for essentially forever, uh, so you can use this as cross-references for the future, uh, so you can keep learning. Even if you learn about Python and you forget about something, you can go watch the video again, uh, or if you find our you know, slides useful for physics content, go check it out as, as well. The Dropbox link where we make all the slides as well as, as, well as uh, the code that we write and all the exercises available is this one, so you'll get that as well. Our page looks like this, so check it out. Uh, we have a lot of questions that we've been trying to address there, so take a look. Um, and last, it, we've created a Dropbox folder for you to share your code with us uh, and to have access to this Dropbox folder, which is different than the other one, you have to send us an email with the subject line Dropbox access, access, and then I will personally put your email into this Dropbox folder, and then you're gonna have editing rights in that folder, so you can put code or put whatever you want in it, okay? So go ahead and do those things. Uh, last, I wanted to announce and remind you that we're gonna have a trivia night in a few hours from today, from right now, actually. So if you're watching this and you wanna have uh, a little bit of fun and test your knowledge on the content that you've learned about so far. Uh, we're gonna host this in a couple hours from now. And this is gonna be hosted by Andrew, Andrew Dotson. If you don't know Andrew, uh, he's an ODU alumnus. So he graduated from, he got his undergraduate degree from, uh, from ODU, from the physics department. And now he's a PhD student, but he's also a, a relatively famous YouTube star. So he has close to five, uh, to 150,000 followers in YouTube. He posts a lot of uh, videos that are either fun or educational, uh, trying to make material that is a little bit advanced, more accessible and fun and less intimidating. Uh, so you can just uh, look up his name in YouTube and you'll find his videos. He's gonna be hosting this session. And if you wanna participate live, um, we might still have a couple of slots available. So why don't you do this? If you're interested in participating, send me an email right now and I'll if we can get you on the session which it starts at 4 p.m okay so send me an email right now and uh with the subject line you can either make it 
uh, Trivia Night Access or yeah, let's make it that Trivia Night or at Trivia Night Access. And then I will try to see if I can make you uh, go and uh, allow you to be in, in, that, uh, in the live session. Uh, but you can still uh, participate. If you don't get to be in the live session, you can still see the video uh, being streamed live in the same platform that you're seeing right now. So you'll have fun anyways. And what we're gonna encourage is that even if you're not in the live session, that you post your answers in the chat, in the in chat feature, so we can see people guessing the right answers. And the content is gonna be all on material that you've learned either in this class or any any other activity in Regis, okay? So we're gonna include material and questions from all the classes that, that we've hosted in Regis. Okay, hopefully that's clear. If any of these things don't make sense, if there's if you have any questions, then do what you should do, you should be doing, which is send us questions in the in the little uh, question box inside of the, the live stream. Okay, uh, maybe I'll take a second to see if our TAs see any questions that I should be addressing about administrative issues or is there any comments that they wanna share with us uh, before I start with material. Are the TA <clears throat> seeing anything that it needs to be shared right now? We don't have any questions necessarily, but we have a, a good few people who are uh, saying hi and uh, checking in from different parts of the world. Cool. Where are they? Where are they coming in from? So we have uh, we have four people saying hello. Uh, Ju Liu Shu uh, from Taiwan says that they're doing great and the weather is average hot and humid. Uh, they want to thank us again for this amazing course and thanks for all the hard work and that they hope we're doing well. We have Christine from Mexico saying, hola, uh, I would like to learn more about plotting. It's kind of hard for me and I would like to learn useful functions. Uh, Max Hanrahan from PA uh, says, I feel good. I was close to an internship at Wesleyan. I think that's how you say that. Uh, before COVID happened. Wesley? And, uh, yeah. Um, but learning Python for physics and especially editing via Jupyter Notebooks has given me a lot. And it feels like the right next step in my life given the circumstances. And finally, oh, that's great to hear. From Indonesia says, uh, good afternoon, sir. Most things are fine in Medan, except for the increasing number of Corona patients. Mostly in the course of the Reyes program, I'm excited to learn more about programming, physics, and engineering stuff. And for now, I do just fine. That's great. Uh, so wait, what was the name of the person from Pennsylvania? Max Hanrahan. Max, uh, I'm sorry, Max, you didn't get the internship. Um, I'm glad that you're staying positive and taking this opportunity to learn a new skill. Um, I think what you and everybody else will see is that programming is a remarkably marketable skill uh, in fact, um, most of my peers that graduated in physics with me did not end up doing physics for their careers, but instead, because they learned so much programming uh, and they were such great programmers, they just went into industry and ended up getting plenty of job opportunities uh, outside of academia. And so uh, programming is, a, is perhaps the most marketable, one of the most marketable skills that you learn in physics. So. Um, um, hope uh, you know. I think this would be useful for everybody in getting the internships that you want in the future. So, okay. Well, I'm glad to hear everybody's okay uh, and you're taking advantage of this. So, why don't we move on? So, let me give you a little recap of what we saw in the last class, and then we start introducing new material. So, I gave a little introduction into particle accelerators, and I give you a little bullet points of how they work from a theorist perspective. Uh, and so I figured I would first um, amplify this introduction by pointing you to material, to content that is already being made available to you in Regis. So you can beef up your understanding in, uh, in, in particle accelerators. And so first there was a talk yesterday from an old uh, previous mentor of mine, Carlos Hernandez Garcia, who is a, oh, that title is wrong. Let's fix it. That title is not the right one. Let's just remove it. There you go, editing on the fly, it works. Uh, okay, so this was a talk by Carlos Hernandez Garcia, who is a scientific, uh, a, a scientific staff 
at Jefferson Lab, and he gave a talk yesterday. And the talk where uh, it was giving you an introduction and how do, you, do we get electrons that are then accelerated here at Jefferson Lab? So Jefferson Lab is a particle accelerator would, in where uh, what we accelerate our electrons. And so the, uh, his expertise is acquiring those electrons. And so the design uh, and construction of the uh, electron gun. And so to find that video, just go to the, the audio recordings page, go to the, scientific, the science session videos right here. Uh, and in fact, the first one that is up right now uh, is his video. And so you can see uh, his title, Getting Electrons for, uh, for Particle Accelerators. The talk was really great and we had a really nice discussion afterwards. Uh, another video that I want to point out is made by uh, Larry Weinstein, who uh, you've seen a video of his on guess, guesstimation, but he's a nuclear uh, physicist. Uh, and he and the rest of the nuclear experimental group here at Jefferson Lab made a video giving you a tour of the, uh, of the um, parts of the lab here, at, uh, of their lab here at Old Dominion. And so you could go check out the same recordings page. You will see a, a video link right here. Um, and so you will get a, a virtual tour of their lab uh, and, and you will be able to access that uh, link to YouTube directly. So I would encourage you. So there they're going to tell you about other aspects of the accelerator, in particular the detector, which is where you detect the particles. And so I would encourage you to go check out that video. Uh, and the last video, that, the last session that I'll promote is the one that is taking place on Monday, uh, which is Max Hansen and is going to be in the science session video. So go take a look and he's going to give you a little, little overview at, uh, of the experiments taking place in the past as well as in the future at CERN, okay? Which is, a, uh, which is the host of the largest particle accelerator in the world, uh, which is depicted in this uh, circular line, line. Okay, so my, my introduction was simplistic, uh, but sufficient for what we want to do. So I gave you I, I define particle accelerators as a set of bullet points, uh, zero being the motivation for particle accelerators, which is to test out our theories and, and access understanding of how nature actually works. Uh, step number one is, you know, after you build the particle accelerators to accelerate them to speeds that are quite high in general, very close to the speed of light, you want to smash them together. Uh, this as a concept, you know, because you, you're smashing them with such high energies, and due to uh, special relativity, you can create a bunch of other particles that are allowed uh, that, that that are allowed given the the conservation of energy of the system. Uh, and then finally, the last step is to detect the debris, detect the final particles that are being created. Uh, in general, these particles could be the same particles that you smash, or they could be different. Okay, so if they're the same, that that would be an elastic reaction. If they're different, that would, that would be an inelastic reaction. Uh, and so, what I wanted to convey here is that for our intensive purposes on the on the data analysis side, what we're going to be analyzing are the different events that take place, or the number of events that take place at some given energy. And so I depicted this uh, in a cartoon where I had two particles smash against each other, uh, and then they uh, repelled each other and uh, and landed in some part of our detectors. Uh, and what is being read into the computer is that there was an event in these two points of my detector. So the detector here are in arrays, which are just basically little buckets where my particles can can land, and then I have a mechanism to see if the particle was there or not. And so I can detect that it landed in this one little bucket versus the other bucket, okay? That's the basic idea. So most of the times the particles don't interact, uh, but you know, from time to time they do interact, and that's when we see them in our detector. And what we're measuring is essentially the number of events that take place as a function of the energy at which we uh, smash these particles together, or as a function of the energy of some of the byproducts of the final state, okay? Uh, and, and here I try to drive home the idea that particle detectors, uh, particle accelerators are remarkably important, but they're only as important, they're only, uh, their consequences are only sensible depending on our, our theoretical predictions. So this is, uh, I would say, uh, a symbiotic kind of relationship that theory and experiments must have in general. So uh, if we don't have 
a theoretical prediction, there's really, or, or a theoretical framework, there's really no meaning to, to the experimental outcomes. Uh, and without experiments, we in general don't know which theories are right, because we can construct any number of theories that don't necessarily describe our world. And as physicists, we're always interested in, in describing our universe, not just any other universe. And, and finally, once we know what theory describes the outcome of the experiment, then we're able that allows us to have an effective understanding of the reaction that took place, uh, or not effective, but an actual understanding of the reaction that took place in the, uh, in, the, in the instant where the two particles were smashed against each other. We don't have a way to resolve what actually happened there without a uh, theoretical framework. And so this effectively, the theory, the theoretical, having pinned down the, the right theory, this allows us to effectively we want rewind back the movie to the moment of the collision. Um, and the other point that I tried to make is that um, there's a there's an important uh, similarity. There's important similarities between the physics of strings vibrating glasses and vibrating bridges and that of particle physics. And, and this is because these are all can be uh, understood as resonating systems. And so, in, in uh, more specifically. What what I'm referring to here is that at some particular frequencies or energies, there can be an amp uh, uh, the amplitude of the vibration for classical physics or the probability for a particle event in particle physics uh, gets amplified. And so there's, uh, there's strong overlaps with these two and I tried to make these um, somewhat tied together uh, in a slide or two. Uh, and, and the picture that I tried to paint in the particle physics world of why, how this manifests is that um, most of the time, again, if I have this picture, most of the times the particles, when they sit by, by each other, they don't really interact. But if I tune their energy to coincide exactly with the energy or the mass of a bound state, then the two particles are going to be that much more attracted to each other and they're going to want to create this one particular bound state. Okay? And then, uh, as a consequence, the probability of them to interact increases. But if this bound state is not really a bound state, but it's, it's, a, it's a bound state that lives for a short period of time and it eventually decays, this is known as a resonance, okay? And so in the decay process, um, it's gonna, so I've labeled this as a resonance with a mass M, okay? Uh, and, and when it decays, according to quantum mechanics, it's gonna, it, we know that it's gonna decay in all possible ways, in, in all ways that are possible, meaning it's going to decay in all, in this context, it's going to decay in all possible directions. Uh, and so we're going to see, as a result, more events in our detector. And so if we scan the energy of the, of the reaction, there's going to be an enhancement in the number of events as a function of the energy that we're scanning. Okay? And it's, that enhancement, that peak, is going to coincide with the mass of that particular bound state that you created or that resonance that you've created at that instant. So that's why you have a little enhancement in the number of events, okay? To fully understand this, you really need uh, not just, well, with quantum mechanics it suffices, but you know, it, this becomes a lot clearer with a, a graduate course in quantum field theory. So if there's really some holes that don't quite make sense, that's okay. Just keep studying physics and eventually it'll start to sink in. It's, not so, it's never obvious to anybody the first time that you hear about these things. And so what this led me to introduce was a very useful distribution function that describes the behavior or the amplitude for, these, uh, for two particle systems to behave as a function of energy when you have a resonance state in the middle. So when you have a state that has, uh, you have an intermediately short-lived state with a mass M that decays and it has a lifetime that is equal to the inverse of this parameter gamma, okay? So this distribution, which is a distribution as a function of energy, so this is a, the amplitude, is a, is a, is a, you can think of it as a probability distribution, so the probability that you have some event uh, some given energy, okay, uh, depends on two parameters. It depends on the mass of the resonance 
m and it it depends on the lifetime of the resonance and here what we're labeling this is parameter gamma which is a greek letter gamma and this is known as a is a, well it's related to the is the is known as a decay width of the resonance and the decay width is nothing more than the inverse of the lifetime of the resonance okay so the more it lives right and this uh the the lifetime is going to be bigger right so then the decay width is going to be smaller the shorter it lives right then the lifetime is going to be smaller so then the the decay width is going to be bigger okay and so gamma essentially tells us about the probability of the particle the original particle to then decay to two particles essentially okay so here blue this blue circle is that resonance, which is a resonance of, is a is an intermediate bound state of these two particles, uh, and then the of the little red dots, which are my individual particles, and then these then decay uh, and go off their merry way, and they don't see each other any further. Okay, and so this distribution is named after these two physicists. Um, as I already mentioned, this is a simplified version of the uh, bright wigner distribution, but that's okay. We don't need to do anything that much more complicated. Okay, so hopefully this has been a useful recap. And um, the first thing that I told you to do is uh, to write some code for um, the bright wigner distribution, which is a function of energy, but it's also a function of these parameters, m and gamma. Okay, and I gave you a little piece of code that I wrote, uh, and I encourage you to do the same. And then on the bottom, what I wanted to do to, you, to try to do is reproduce these plots. Uh, in particular, um, I made you try to guess, but I didn't even give you that much time, which value of M I picked. And you can see that these are all pick, peaked at a uh, value of 2.5, which tells me that the value that I picked for M is 2.5. Okay. Uh, then the next exercise was for me to, for you to guess which value of gamma I used to generate each one of these colors. So I used three different values of gamma, one, two, and three. And what I want you to do is identify which one of these uh, corresponds to which value. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to get you to answer this. So perhaps, why don't we do this? Uh, go ahead and answer in the chat, which ones do you, cor do you think corresponds to which? So when gamma is equal to one, which one of the colors should describe this amplitude? Uh, when gamma is equal to two, which color should describe that amplitude? And, and same thing for three, okay? So try to associate each one of these numbers with the colors. And it would be useful for you to perhaps give a little explanation. Uh, I, I ask you to develop a little bit of intuition so how does the distribution behave as I vary gamma? Okay. And so why don't you go ahead and write that and try to explain it? Preferably, you've written some code and tried to reproduce these plots. Um, so why don't you send some comments and we'll give the TAs. When, once the TAs have heard a good answer, maybe they can let me know and we can try to read it. Okay, and we'll come back to this. How does that sound, TAs? Sounds good. Cool. Okay. So the next step was imagine that you're now working for a nuclear particle experimental group. And you're given some experimental data, and here's you know what the data looks like, and you're, what you're seeing is the mean value of these distributions uh, with the uh, uncertainty on top of it, and then you are being asked, what is uh, the best value of the mass of the individual particles? So you see, there's a little peak, right? You can see the data, right? And you can see there's a little bit of peak. And you, you're being told to pick out what value of M and what value of gamma best describes the experimental data. In particular, you want to fit, you want to 
try to impose this distribution onto the experimental data. And the question is, how do you do this? And the answer is using a routine called fitting or a procedure called fitting. Okay, uh, so let's get to that. So fitting is, is really nothing more than the process by which we determine the value of the parameters to best fit the data, okay? So essentially, I wanna grab some distribution, uh, some line, and I wanna find the values that where I draw that line, it, it overlaps the closest to the data. That's the basic idea of fitting, okay? And so here is some data, okay? that I've generated. I generated myself to look kind of like experimental data, okay? Uh, and, and I've used two values of M, uh, sorry, I've, I've used a value of M and a value of gamma, three and 0.5. And here you can see that uh, if I determine, if I use the Breitwigner function using these two values of M, M and gamma, so two and 0.3, I'm really far away from the data. If I dial the parameters to 2.5 to n.4, I get a little closer. And then, you know, as I get, I dial these even further, I get even closer and closer. But what we want to do is really to make this systematic. I don't want to keep guessing and see how far away I am. And also I want to use my eyes. I want to use a quantitative measure, okay? And so here's where uh, goodness of fits come in. So, there's different ways of defining how good a function fits a data. The most standard one is the one that I'm gonna present here, okay? And, and so um, what we're gonna do is define a measure, a quantity that tells us how good the fit is for a given value of the parameters, okay? Uh, in other words, I, I want to minimize the distance from our expected value, okay, PI, let's say, uh, and the measured value of our distributions, okay? So I have some data and I'm, lab I'm labeling uh, these as YI. So I've measured some data and these YI are giving, giving me the mean values of that data. And what I expect the data, I'm gonna call that PI. In general, this is gonna be a function of some parameters. And so in this, in this case, when I have a, a, a bright Wigner distribution, this function PI depends on two parameters, M and gamma, okay? Um, and so the question is, and, and really I should have made this even more explicit because these depend uh, on, on the energy EI. So I can edit this later uh, or I can make this clear. Let me see if I can do this on the fly. Let me come back to this in a second, but because there might be a little bit of confusion here. But the point is that what I want to do is grab my data, the mean values of that data, yi bar, and then subtract my expected value of the data at that point, okay? And I'm going to call that pi m comma gamma. And you see that m and gamma it's the same value for all my locations where the data lies, okay? And what I'm gonna do is divide this by the standard deviation of the ith energy bin, of that given energy bin, okay? Uh, and so I here is responding to the energy bin that I'm considering. So you can imagine, here's one energy, here's another energy, here's another energy, and here's another one, okay? And so, the yi bar corresponds to the where the location where the the little circles lie, uh, and pi corresponds to the value that my function takes at that point at that energy. Okay. And so I'm summing over all points, but notice I'm grabbing the spec the the data. I'm subtracting the the expected value. I'm dividing this by the standard deviation, and then I'm taking the square of everything. And that's what I'm adding. So I'm adding a bunch of positive numbers, okay? And so what you see is that this function is always positive, okay? And so the bigger it is, what this tells us is the bigger this function is, 
that corresponds to the biggest distance between my measure values and my expected values. But what I'm, what I'm do is minimize that, all right? And so the goal is to vary these parameters m and gamma so that the distance between yi bar and my expected value is the smallest, okay? And so really what I wanna do is grab this function on the left and minimize it by varying the values of m and gamma. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't make sense, that's okay. We're gonna keep defining this in a different ways, okay? So to get a little bit of a sense of what this function is doing, let me now grab the same plot that I generated before, okay? But what I'm gonna do is quote the value of this thing. And I should say, this thing is a function that is called, uh, it, this symbol is a Greek letter for chi. And because I'm squaring it, I'm calling that chi squared, okay? So in short, I'm gonna be referring to this as a, as, a, as a chi squared, okay? You'll get used to that if you're not immediately, you know, if it sounds a little weird to your ears at first. And so what I can do is, is determine what the chi squared is for each one of these lines, okay? And you can see for the red, where I had the, chosen these values of m and gamma, I have a chi-squared that is uh, closer to 3,000, okay? It's, it's big, right? 2,600, yada, 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 big. As I get closer, as the line gets closer to my data, you see now the chi-squared is still pretty big, but it's not as big as it once was, right? So now it's closer to 2,000 than 3,000. That seems like an improvement. And the green one, you see now it's going from 2,000 to 500, okay? So this function, this chi-squared, is doing exactly what uh, we wanted to do. It's telling us that the red is much further away for really describing the data than the blue. But the blue is even further away than the green. The green is still not good enough. Uh, it's not telling us yet, you know, it's not giving us a chi-squared that is something that we would be comfortable with, and I'll explain well, I don't know if we'll get to explain this, uh, but this is still a large chi-squared, okay? And so uh, eventually what we want is a chi-squared that is as close to zero as possible, okay? It's never gonna be quite zero. Uh, in this case, it is because I made life easier. Um, but eventually we want something to, to essentially be right on top of the line and with a chi-squared that is as close to zero as possible. Uh, and so what this is telling us, at least, is giving us a measure that allows us to quantify what a poor job we did in guessing the actual underlying values of M and gamma is, okay? So to, to then understand what this function is doing, uh, what we, or why this, I mean, hopefully this, understand, this explains why this, this function is useful, okay? So it's giving us a measure to show how good our functions are compared to the true online function that describes the data, okay? Um, and so, but this function is really a function of the parameters that we wish to determine, so m and gamma. And, and the beauty of it is that the, it tells us exactly what is the optimal choice of the parameters uh, that coincide, that, so it, it tells us a, a definition of what the optimal choice of these parameters, m and gamma, that we want. Uh, and these coincide with the minimal value of the chi-squared because the, the chi-squared is just adding a bunch of positive numbers, right? And so what we want is to try to make it as close to zero as possible, okay? And so what I'm doing here, this, is, this function is a function of two parameters. And so I could have shown uh, uh, a three-dimensional plot um, I chose not to do that. I chose to do a little something simpler, uh, but it's perhaps a little harder to see. And, and so what I'm doing is I'm plotting the chi-squared function for that data as a function of m here, okay? And then what I'm doing is I'm showing you different lines where I'm fixing uh, the, the value of gamma, okay? And so you can see if I fix gamma to be two point, uh, point 0.2, then you get these lines over here. Okay, and you see you have wild oscillations, but it never really gets to its actual minima. You have a bunch of local minima, but you don't have an absolute, 
Okay, well, you're never really reaching the absolute, the absolute minimum. If I make gamma equal to 0.3, that's this line over here. And you see it gets a little bit better, but again, it doesn't reach the minimum. Then I dial gamma to be 0.4 and it does quite a bit better. Okay, so it's over here. Uh, and you see it almost gets to its minimum. And then I chose uh, gamma equals 0.5, which I knew to be the actual answer. Uh, and then you see that as a function of, of then it, it reaches zero. And that's its, uh, it reaches zero at a specific value, uh, which is, let's zoom in. And it reaches zero, you see, at m equals three, right? And that was exactly the value that I input it, right? And so this is just to illustrate that the minimum of this function coincides with the values of the parameters m and gamma that I chose to put in into the data. So I knew the answer here, and I'm just checking that this function chi squared is its minimum to coincide with the parameters that I chose uh, as it should, because what I'm doing is minimizing the distance between the measured distribution or the, yeah, the measured distribution as a function of energy and my predicted distribution, okay? So, so the hardest task, I mean, defining this, this function is, is quite powerful uh, and it's uh, quite useful. The hardest thing is really to find these parameters that minimize this function, but which is at the crux of a lot of uh, fits of data, okay? Um, and, but really, I mean, this function works remarkably well, it's remarkably powerful. You have to modify it a little bit when you have more complicated data than the one that we're gonna be considering. Uh, but it, 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 this is very close to actual functions that we use in many of our papers to do, fit our own data, okay? Uh, so this is a really powerful tool, even in, you know, in cutting edge research. And, but the real problem is, is, is writing code that finds the minimization of these functions. Um, and so you can try guessing as I tried doing, but you, you see that that's pretty slow. Uh, or we can try generating random numbers and sampling where we land uh, in, in, this, in this space of parameters. Um, but in general, you need something more systematic. That's typically not gonna be good enough. Fortunately, there's many optimization routines out there uh, and we're gonna use some routines. I'm gonna show you uh, an example of a routine that, that is gonna be good enough for the exercises that we're gonna be playing with. Um, and and here, just so you get a little bit familiarized with the different routines, I, I put a little link to different visualization of uh, illustrations, of, um, animations of different uh, minimization routines, and you can see what they're doing as a function of the parameters for different uh, example functions. So this is quite nice. So I would, I would strongly encourage you to take a look, and you can see the definition of this, minimis, this optimization routines. Um, for the intensive purposes of this class, all I care is that you can use them, okay? I don't really care which routine you use, what your favorite is, if you understand them or not, it doesn't matter. What they're doing is just trying to find the absolute minimum of a function that you give it. Sometimes you will get errors because you might not, you know, the routines, if you start far away from the minimum, then the routine might struggle to find the minimum. So it's a function of what your guesses are sometimes. And so you sometimes have to give it smart guesses. So you have to use a little bit of intuition. Um, but uh, I'm not gonna go into those kinds of details. So I think perhaps it is a good point to stop for a second and see if there's any comments. So what I have next is, is some exercises to, to give you uh, so you can start playing with this. Uh, and so I figured I would stop for a second and see if the TAs had any questions or comments uh, or if anybody was able to accurately guess or determine what values of gamma correspond to which colors. Before we get to the uh, the one response regarding uh, the guesses for gamma. Uh, sorry, Greg, I see you're trying to talk, but we can't hear you right now. Oh, no. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes? I, yep, I can hear you. Okay. All right, awesome, thank you. So before we get to the, the one guess we had for gamma, uh, someone asked if gamma is like a, a frequency since it's the uh, inverse of the lifetime of the resonance. Um, 
it has units of, of energy which coincide with uh in units where you set the speed of light equal to one does coincide with the units of frequency or the yeah frequency yeah so one over time is equal to energy in the units of when you set the speed equal the speed of light equal to one which is what i've been doing here so yes you can think of it as a frequency essentially uh for gamma um, are there any quest other questions uh no, yeah there was a um really? uh, an answer from brian go about uh which values of gamma uh-huh uh, Uh, so, what is it, gamma? I mean, what is it, go? Oh, Brian. Brian says uh, gamma equals one for the red graph, gamma equals two for the blue curve, and three for the green curve. From the equation, we can see that E is max if E is equal to M. Yeah, so when E is equal to M, that's true. So that we can look at this. Uh, if this doesn't make sense to anybody out there, let me see if I can share my. Let's see if Brian is right. Mm -hmm. Come on. There we go. All right, Brian, let's put you to a test. So let me look at the distribution. So let me see if I can put them next to each other. So to figure out which color corresponds to which value of gamma, we can see that the peaks, right, um, are all the same location and they have different heights. And so we can do a little bit of simple algebra, which is good because it's really my favorite kind of algebra. I don't like to make my life hard. Uh, and so here we go. We have P of E is equal to M cubed gamma E squared minus M squared. Oop. Uh, okay. And so the height is going to correspond to where the minimum, uh, when, so the height of P is going to correspond to when the denominator is at its minimum, right? And we can see that this is going to correspond to when E squared is equal to M squared. And so at that limit, which we already knew this, we already talked about this. We see that the one term is zero, the first term is zero in the denominator, and then I'm left with this, right? And so then I can, don't have to keep track of the, I see that I get one over um, the M squares cancel, I'm left with one over gamma, right? And so the smaller gamma is, the bigger the height is, right? And so, for m is equal to for uh yeah so then the smaller so the smaller gamma is the, the bigger is uh the peak and so the smallest value and then i screw up oh yeah i did screw up i had a factor of i was trying to reconcile things makes sense there we go good okay now everything makes sense uh, and so I use a, a, when gamma is equal to one, what I should have, let me move this over here. Uh, there we go. Let me move. So when gamma is equal to one, I should have a height that corresponds to 2.5, right? When gamma is equal to two, as you have 
2.5 divided by 2, right? And then one and a half gamma equals to 3. I should have 2.5 divided by 3, which coincides with this, right? I have 1.5 over here, well, 1.25 over here, 2.5. So there's gamma equals 1, gamma equals 2, gamma equals 3. All right. Good job, Brian. All right. Anything else that we should talk about before we move on? No? I think you're good to go for now. Awesome. Great. Cool. So essentially what I have next is just problems for you guys to start fitting. Uh, you're never gonna really understand this until you start applying it yourself, or at least I never do. Um, so how are you gonna do fits? Well, I, I'm not expecting you to write your minimization, minimization algorithms. You're welcome to, by all means. Uh, don't let me stop you. Uh, that being said, we have a library in Python called uh, SciPy, 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 I think, um, that has different functions that allow you to optimize almost any function that you wish, okay? And so there's many routines there, and so we're gonna make, take advantage of them. So you can take a look at, uh, at the uh, SciPy documentation for optimization routines, so go ahead and look at that. Um, and so what I do, what I did for my code is that, and I'm showing you bits of pieces of my code, is that I've defined a chi-squared, which is a function of a two bar of a um, of a list of two elements, m and gamma. And so I define this function, you, you give it m underscore gamma, I translate that into uh, two distinct floats, so two distinct numbers, m gamma. And then here I've defined the function, the, the Breitwigner function that I define a couple, so I call that function that I define a couple of slides ago. So here's my function for the Breitwigner distribution, okay? So it's called by the chi-square function. And then um, I define P, the outputs of this function, which depends on some, in, uh, some values of X. Well, what is X? What are the XX? So the XX are my dependent variables. So and these slides have been a little bit sloppy, but the, the horizontal axis and always the energy of the distributions, okay? The horizontal axis is just the, the depend the, the sorry, I meant to say the independent variable, not the dependent variable. So x is the is the independent variable, okay? So in this case, my my Xs correspond to the values where my data is being measured. So my data, let's say, looks something like this. Okay. I can make this bigger. Okay. So this is defined, you can see that defined by a value, let's call this one x naught, x1, x2, da, 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 all the way to xn, okay? So my, and my x's is an array of x0, x1,
where x is just the values of the energies that I've determined, right? I could have easily, for the sake of maybe clarifying or confusing you further, I can just replace these with energies. E0, E1, E2, En. And so here I have E0, E1, all the way to En. Okay? So that's what my x's are. Well, what are going to be my y's? Well, I'm determining this distribution of events. This is my uh, bright Wigner distribution. And I'm determining, let's pick a different color at some point. And I think I call these, sure did, and call these y's. Okay, but let's, let's stick to the this would be P0, P1, ta -ta -ta, uh, P2, etc. right? And so my Y's it's the same thing, but of the values of the distribution at those points. Sometimes you'll hear me describe this as the amplitude for particles to interact. That's just the, the, it's actually what it is in physics. It's just a scattering amplitude, but it doesn't matter. It's just some distribution, okay? Uh, and so let's look at this. And then I have some sigs, sigs, okay? Let's, def let's figure out what that is. Well, you can see that each one of these points it's defined by some standard deviation, right? This is sigma zero right here. Let me use a different color. Let's make it, oh, I don't know, cyan, sure. Good choice, everybody. Uh, so here's six. Is that clear enough? No, that didn't sound too convincing. Let's make it black. I haven't used black, right? There you go, the sig zero. This is sig one, which is a distance from the, the average point to the tallest point in the error bar, okay? Sig two, et cetera, right? So what is sigs? Well, it's nothing more than our array of sig zero, sig one, da, 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 all the way to sig n. In this case, they're going to be all the same. They're not going to be the same for all the exercises. So in general, what you have to define is the chi-squared, which is going to be a function in this case. So in this case, it's going to be a function of m and gamma, which is equal to the sum of the ith element minus of of the your data minus the the predicted value of this which is a function of energy so you're going to give it the i the i energy okay m and gamma okay all this divided by the i element of the standard deviation all squared okay And this you can write in, in Python quite simply using uh, a sum function, which I think is in, is this in NumPy? Is sum in NumPy? Or is it? I should have put a little. So I can just do this simply by uh, Taking the sum so yeah the power sum is in numpy okay so you have to put it on numpy okay you just have to call it properly uh and then you define your your function define it so that it inputs arrays Something like this, okay. 
uh, and then you proper parentheses, divide by sigma i, and then comma, you take this to the, the square pop to the second power, and then you sum it. And this should work. Simple. Okay, and so that's what I'm defining. Oh, and I should have said squared. Okay. If I define a function chi to underscore Fry Wigner, that essentially does this, just in a couple more steps. I define uh, the input to be m gamma, then I define the pi's to be this function. Notice I put the, the independent variables to the far right, it's your choice, whatever you want. It's different than what I wrote here. That's okay, I'm trying to keep you on your toes, right? Uh, and so then chi two zero, oh, you see I called numpy under uh, period sum, then I took power, exactly what I just wrote down. I define something that is called the uh, degrees of freedom, which is the number of data points minus the number of variables that you're fitting. I don't do anything with it, so you can just ignore this, okay? Notice my minimization routine doesn't start into here. So it's just a function, right? I could just define this for any value of M and gamma. My minimization routine now is simple. Um, and it does this. It just, it, first I give it some guess because I told you it's useful to, to have some guesses for these parameters so that you have some intuition. And you can, typically if your routine, routine is sufficiently robust, it doesn't matter what values you guess, but Sometimes it, it, it can get stuck in a local minima. And so it's useful to have some physical intuition, okay? Uh, in reality, in, in real, honestly, uh, analysis, uh, this is one of the hardest things, is having uh, an intuition of what the actual underlying parameters is that will do the best fit of your data. Uh, and so this is always a general problem, okay? Uh, and there's many ideas of how to circumvent this, but it depends on the, you know, on this, on your particular study. So then here I call this function optimize within SciPy. And then you see, I use it here. And then within optimize, there's a, so this is actually a, a sub library of SciPy. So within optimize, there's a, uh, a function called minimize, which takes your function your guesses, and then you can uh, you can specify which minimization routine you want. Here I picked one, okay? This is, this is one of the, um, this is actually illustrated, it's the first one that is illustrated in this illustration uh, of minimization routines, okay? So take a look at that, if you're interested in which one I picked. Um, and then what I grabbed is that I just, uh, what I did is just I grabbed the output of this minimization and I printed it. And then I, I print it, what I return is not the whole output, but a part of the output, okay? So let's look at the output. This is the output. I, I just called, I called my function. Uh, so this is within a code that I wrote, which is uh, BW underscore plots. And I've shared this with you already. Let me double, let me fact check myself that I've actually shared this with you already. If not, I can. Sure it did, it's already in Dropbox. So you can see it, this code right here, okay? So I went to IPython and I called this code uh, and you see I'm printing M gamma and, and if you haven't used this before, the printing root uh, prints everything that is inside of the, the parentheses. And here I put some string, which is M underscore gamma, and then I put comma and then I printed M, uh, M underscore gamma. This is some text, right? That is just for me to, to look at uh, or for the user to look at. And this is the actual output, okay? So let's look at the actual output. You see, what does it print? It prints M underscore gamma, which is exactly what I told it to print. So good job, yay. Uh, and then uh, it's, it has a, a, a quite a bit of jargony stuff, okay? Uh, most of which you don't need to know. The thing that you need to know is the first thing that appears, okay? So there's different aspects of uh, what is being, you know, there's different, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into what each one of these things are. You can just look at the uh, documentation for SciPy for that. Um, but 
you see that the number that is being printed out is 2.99 uh, and comma, and then the next number is point uh, 0.4999, which coincides with pretty close to the values that I inputted, which is m equals three uh, and 0.5. So within the, uh, you know, within two significant figures, it, it's an agreement. So that's, that's great. And then you see that at the very end, uh, it, there's a, a comment, so there's a lot of comments, and then X, and it just gets me the variable. And you see what I return is M dot X, which is M, uh, M underscore gamma dot X, and then underscore gamma is just all this stuff. And then by calling, by putting a dot and X, what it returns is this particular array in the bottom. So it just returns this one array. So this is the thing that I actually care about, the values of the parameters of chi-squared that minimize it, okay? So, uh, so yeah, the resulting values of n of, of m gamma are these, okay? Uh, and then what I do is that I plot it on top of my, in my plotting, my plotting code, I plotted the data that I inputted, and then the resulting best values of m and gamma, you see it crosses every single one of the points. So the chi-squared uh, actually was the value. Yeah, the, the value of the function is 10 to the minus five. That's a pretty good zero, okay? Pretty close to zero. So um, that's good enough for, for what we're looking at. And so you see everything, all the points, the line just crosses all the different points, okay? So if you wanna know how I made this plot um, and you wanna copy some of this minimization code, just go to the Dropbox folder it's already there for you, okay? So you can just look inside of this code. Good. All right. Um, maybe, okay, no, why don't we just keep going? Why don't I just give you the, all the problems that you have to do and then we'll see if there's any questions. Um, so to start things first, so what I'm gonna do is give you three fitting exercises. So the first exercise was just to write code for the Brightwing distribution. And hopefully you've done that. I see that some of you are still working on last week's code. That's fine. We'll, you know, just whenever you catch up, we'll try to help you um, catch up, okay? And so um, what I'm showing you here is some data. So I'm gonna give you, um, how many data is I think I'll give you three pieces of data, okay? So I'm gonna give you some data. The first data, you can find it right here in Dropbox, uh, Python for physics underscore 2020 project number four fitting data constant underscore const underscore data dot uh, text. And so the first thing we're going to do is just fit a constant. Okay. We're just going to grab a bunch of bit data that is all supposed to be the same thing uh, and, and just make sure that you can fit this. Okay. Um, and so here is the 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 data i'm making it into they look they, they're in three different columns the first column is the independent variables okay the second column is going to be the the measurements that you've taken so the average value of the measurements that you've taken so you've asked a few people for the same quantity let's say let's say i ask each one of you uh yeah, right, let's say that I, I separate all of you into groups of 10 and I ask you all to guess my height, okay? Everybody should guess the same value. My height is my height, so it's just one number, but each group of 10 people would have guessed my height to be one number. And so there will be one value, one, center, one average of that, and then a standard deviation. Another group will get an, uh, some average value and then some standard deviation and so forth and so forth, okay? Uh, so this is essentially that. And so what we want to do is try to fit all this different data to just one value, okay? So here's a little script for how to load the data. So first, you have to put, you, you got to take the data and put it in your directory. You give it, uh, you have to identify the file name, which I've given you. And then you use the same numpy routine that we've used several times for loading text files. And so this, this makes, this grabs your, your text file directly into an array. So that's beautiful, it's quite nice. And it has to have this format. It has to be a bunch of columns essentially, okay? And so then I, I grab the data, which has been translated into an array, 
Okay. And I just print out the shape just to see what it looks like. And it looks a hundred by three uh, array. Good, right? So I have hundred data points along the, the vertical axis and then I have three columns. Great, okay? So that makes sense. So hundred points along the vertical axis, three columns. Then uh, what I'll do is that I'll take the transpose of this. So I'll make it a three by a hundred matrix. If this is gibberish to you, uh, don't worry. Just grab this thing, put dot T, and then you will get something and then translate this into XS, XY, and sig S, okay? So then each one of these should now be what I've grabbed. What I did is I, I grabbed this column and I made it into one array. I grabbed this column and made it into another array. And then I grabbed this column and made it into another array. And so now what I'm doing is printing the shape of each one of these, these columns to make sure that indeed they're all the same shape and that they're all uh, one dimensional arrays of 100. And that's what they are. So you get 100, 100, 100. Good, okay. Now that you have this, um, and, and you can pretty much guess what average value I'm putting, right? Because you can see that all the average values, oh, they're close to, I don't know, close to 1,000, right? It looks like 1 times 10 to the 3, 9.9 .9 times 10 to the, um, to the 2, and so forth, right? So this looks like all oscillating at 100, okay? And so this is just a check that you're loading data correctly, that you have a reasonable uh, chi-square routine and that you're able to work out. Um, so, so the average value, the number that I input in generating this fake data was, hun was 100, okay? And so this is all to check that you have understanding of the minimization routines, of loading the data and so forth, uh, so that you gain some confidence that then in the next problems that we do, uh, which are a little harder, um, you're gonna not worry so much about the first steps of the of the calculation, okay? So all you have to then do is fit this data to to a constant, and this is quite easy. So it's a, you you define a function of chi squared, which is um, so so in this case, what you have to do is just define a function. Let's call this one chi2 for chi squared, chi squared. So the symbol chi, you can write it uh, phonetically as chi, okay? That's why I've been using that. Okay, so chi2 for chi squared underscore constant. Uh, const, okay? And let's make this a function of C, okay? And what I'm gonna do is essentially, I wanna just define a function that does this, okay? So there's many ways of doing this. I could just write, essentially, um, just return. I could do this in one line if I wanted to. So return um, sum of power of ys minus c. So this is now, ys is uh, the data that we loaded up. Remember, I grabbed the second column and made that ys, right? Um, the first column is xs, but it doesn't, I don't, it, because I'm fitting a constant, it doesn't depend on the independent variable. So xx will not play a role here. And then I'm going to divide by sigma, sigma s, okay? And so I have the difference between my data and my expected value, which, should be, which is the same for all of them. Great. Divided by sigma s, wonderful. Uh, squared, then I got to close parentheses. So there you go. I could have just made my code in one line. Is this the best kind of code? No, because I'm not putting any comments and it's usually better to break things up. My students can tell you that I try, it's hard for me to debug their codes uh, when I don't really know what, you know, when everything is too compactified and there's too many parentheses. Alex, I see him chuckling, maybe he can confirm. 
Most okay. definitely. Yeah. So I don't know. You can call whatever. Just take steps. Okay. I like to do things like D vec for difference of vectors. And you will see me doing this quite a bit. Uh, so I'll do uh, define my the difference between the expected the measured data and the expected data, right? Um, and then maybe I'll define. I mean, th this is too easy, so I don't know. You might want to just jump the gun, or maybe say something like arg for argument uh, dvec over sigma, sigma s. And then finally, what you just return is this thing. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you don't want to do, this is, this is such an easy example that you don't want to overthink it too much. But in general, you want to have, you know, and you would want to have some comments like uh, put in a different color, right? And if you have a good text editor, it will do that for you. So it would be like, you know, here, quotation marks, um, define difference between da, 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 okay? So you can put a little comment there. My code is much cleaner than my writing. So, you know, um, hopefully that's useful to you. So once you've done that, then uh, you define some function of chi squared, which depends on this constant. Then you grab the same piece of code, essentially, the same piece of code over here, where you minimize the function, but now you define a different uh, input, a different input function. You have to put some guesses, and that's essentially it. Okay, so why don't you try that out? Uh, why don't you send the message to us right now and see if this makes sense to you or not? Um, and then in the meantime, I'll keep introducing to other tasks. Okay. Okay, so this is just to get you comfortable and make sure that you can, do, you know, you, you can load the data, you can define a minute, you know what the answer is, okay? So that's great. Um, and so, so yeah, so this is just a, a check of your understanding. Then let me give you some, um, some real data, which is theoretical data. Um, this is gonna be quote unquote data, okay? So, I've mentioned this to you before, that I work in a field known as lattice quantum chromodynamics. And, and the idea of, of lattice QCD is that we can use the, the, um, the theory of quarks and gluons, which only depend on a small number of parameters. And the main parameter that I'm concerned about, uh, which is a independent variable, is the masses of the quarks, okay? So by putting in the masses of the quarks and then the, the, the underlying theory, we can essentially theory into a computer, uh, crank out numbers, and then what comes out are physical observables, uh, including uh, the pion mass, so the mass of the lightest uh, state in the theory, which is the pion, and we mentioned this before, so uh, hopefully this, these words are starting to sink in. Uh, then we can also measure the nuclear mass. We can essentially measure almost, you know, any number of uh, nuclear physics obstacles that you might start imagining. Um, this is hard in general, but certainly we can extract masses of, of simple states and we can do more sophisticated stuff than that. And, and so what I'm giving you in this Dropbox folder uh, or in this Dropbox file, I should say, is again same structure as before some text file with some independent variables which is the masses of the pion so i'm gonna uh i want to plot the nuclear mass as a function of the pion masses so you input the quark masses into your calculation but really what comes out is the pion mass the nuclear mass and other things okay and so i want to understand what how does the nucleon depend on the mass of the pion and there's many good theoretical uh, reasons as to why 
um, there should be a strong dependence on these two, okay? Um, and maybe I can talk about these some other time. But for now, um, I'm just gonna show you some data. This is honest to God data from different experiments, uh, from different uh, theoretical groups out there in the world that have done the same calculation over and over again, okay? And, and so this is the data. You have the independent variables, the pi mass, the dependent variables, which is the nuclear mass. So here it is. And here is the standard, uh, the standard error of, uh, of both of, of the nuclear mass, okay? So the, of the uh, dependent variable, okay? And so, as I already said, this is real honest to God data from groups out there. And so let's plot it. I've given you these numbers. Uh, they're in this file. And so we can just start plotting them. And this is what we find. And this is quite interesting. So on the x-axis, what I'm showing you is a pion mass. Uh, and so here's a little cartoon of the pion. Uh, and I'm using the pion in some funny units. It doesn't matter. Some units of, of energy, okay? Uh, and there's some arguments as to that one can understand that this, the, the pion is a, is, a, is a very special particle in this theory in quantum chromodynamics, uh, and its, its mass is closely related to the mass of the quarks. Um, on the uh, y-axis, what I'm showing you is the nuclear mass, okay? So here's a little cartoon of the nucleon, and here you see that there seems to be some linear trajectory in the dependence of the nuclear mass with the pion mass, okay? So this is interesting on its own. Like, wh why is it a line, right? It looks like it should have this behavior, right? There's really no, um, people didn't really predict that it would have this behavior. Another point is that um, I don't have time to explain this, but the pion mass is, uh, is really is proportional to the square root of the masses of the quark. And so in the limit that I take the pi on mass to zero, which is this limit, in that limit, the masses of the quarks are being set to zero. And if you remember into the beginning of the last lecture, I should have perhaps reemphasized this at the beginning, um, the Higgs gives mass to, here, why don't we go back? Let me go back for a second. I went through this whole song and dance where I explained that the Higgs gives mass to quarks, okay? The proton is made out of quarks. Uh, and so you might naively think that quarks are the source of the mass of the proton. And, and this plot is gonna try to convince you that this is not the case. You, of course, have to trust me in some uh, theoretical points, but, but that's okay. Um, but the point is that because the proton gives mass, the proton gives mass to, say, the hydrogen, which is this picture, uh, and in general, the proton and the, and the neutron together essentially cover um, almost 100% of the masses of all molecules, uh, you might be then, you know, lead to believe that because this chain of logic is true, meaning that our mass essentially all comes from atomic nuclei, and the Higgs gives mass to quarks, and you, one naively would guess that our mass inside of the proton or in, inside of atomic nuclei comes from our quarks, we, we would then be led to believe that Higgs is our, the source of our mass. Um, but that's not true, and that's the point of this plot because it turns out that our mass does not really come from the quarks themselves. Uh, and so let's go back to that plot. Scanning forward, there we are. And why is this? The reason is because here you can see in this plot that it looks like if this is indeed a straight line, then this line does not, inter it, it does not intersect with zero when I'm setting the quark masses to zero. Instead, it seems to intersect to some value that is non-zero. Uh, and so in this limit, in the limit that I take the pion, 
the pion mass to zero, and, and consequently, I'm also taking the quark masses to zero, then the contribution of the Higgs to our mass does not really matter. Really, our, the mass that we are made out of uh, is, is, is largely due to the dynamics of gluons. So it's largely due to just uh, QCD effects, okay? And so what you're gonna have to do then is grab this data that I'm giving you and then fit the data using this simple prescription that uh, the data satisfies a form of M0, which is a constant, plus the pion mass, which is your, your independent variable, right? It's a, uh, the, the variable on the x-axis, times some uh, constant B, which is a slope. And what you're gonna do is just fit the data, and this is what I got. And you see that it looks pretty much like a straight line. There is some oscillations away from the straight line, right? And that's what real data looks like. So that's okay, okay? So find what this value of B, B naught is, or M naught is, and compare that to experimental value of the nucleon. And tell me which percent uh, of the mass is associated with the fact that the quark mass is, is not zero. Or in other words, how, what percentage of the mass comes from the dynamics of QCD for the nucleon, okay? All right, good luck with that. Let us know if you have any questions. Uh, and I think this is the last exercise that I have. Yes, this is the last exercise, good. Um, let's fit a bright Wigner, right? I told you that uh, essentially every single experiment out there where we find some new particle, well, not every, everyone, but many, many, many of them are being described with bright Wigners, okay? So this is a really useful uh, expression and you've already written code for making plots for bright wagner distributions uh, and so here I'm going to generate I generated some some mock data for you uh, so here's some some data that I've generated for you and so what I want you to do is just perform a fit try to reproduce this data the, this distribution you know the, the plot that I'm giving you uh, using your own chi squared okay and so this is a, a nice exercise that, you know, if you can do fits of these three examples, so first a constant, then a linear fit, and then a, a two-dimensional parameter fit that is um, not as simple as a linear fit, then I think you're in a good shape to start doing more complicated fits out there, okay? So I think this is a good stopping point uh, for this content. So. What we've introduced is a, a measure that gives us the goodness of a fit, so uh, goodness of fit, which is the chi-squared. Uh, and in general, it can be written this way, where you have uh, your, uh, your dependent variables and you want to fit some function, which depends on some set of parameters, which are called C over here, but it can be any number of parameters. Uh, and it depends that you want to evaluate this function at the independent variables xi, divide this by this difference between the standard deviation, uh, take the square of them, and add them. And, and so chi squares are a remarkably useful tool in performing any number of fits. Um, we use them all the time in, in uh, data analysis, both in experiment as well, in, as, well as in theory. Uh, and the new physics concepts that we wrote down, so basically one equation that I've wrote, written down uh, is that associated with the bright Wagner distribution, which tells us how the probability of particles to interact in the presence of a, of a, a narrow resonance um, decay with gamma and some mass m, um, and it can be described in this way. So bright Wagner's distributions are slightly, in general, more complicated than this, but I want to simplify things. So why don't we take some time to uh, answer your questions, whatever they may be. Uh, as always, I wanna encourage you to fill out our survey. Uh, we wanna hear your thoughts on, on how you, know, you guys think this is working out for you and what we can do better. Um, I can tell you that there's already talk of doing this again um, in the next year or so. And so we definitely wanna learn from our experience um, so please send us your feedback because this is really useful uh, for us to know how to make this better for you and others.
<clears throat> and then while I'll wait for the TAs to speak up, um, let me remind you that we have um, trivia night happening in a couple hours. And if you want to join this and test your knowledge, um, we might still have some slots. Uh, so you can feel free to send me an email with the title line trivia night. Okay. So, uh, so I think you've uh, ended up answering a few of the questions already. However, uh, we did uh, get a question from Lucas from San, uh, Santo Andre, Brazil. Just wanted to clarify, he says, sorry, but just to make sure in exercise two, I should first guess the value of C and then minimize chi squared in order to find the right value of C. Um, yeah, it, you, you don't have to put an, um, so I should have said, you don't have to put a guess into your minimizer, but it will converge faster. Um, and sometimes you can do clever, write your code in a way that it finds what the optimal, you can write some code that gives you um, a reasonable approximation for where the optimal value of at least one of the parameters may be. So for example, with this data, right? Um, let's say that um, I don't know what optimal value of M to pick, right? Say that I had to fit this data. Um, what you can tell, what you can, what you know though, is that the peak of the distribution is gonna coincide with the mass of your resonance. So you have some physical intuition Let's play around with that. <clears throat> I have some. Well, let me grab my. Oh, sh shoot. Okay. Imagine this was my data, right? We already looked at this in some detail. Um, and so what you can do is write uh, some code that grabs the corresponding value in the x-axis for the maximum value in the y-axis, okay? And so how do we write that? Um, first, you can say, so I wanna basically, let's say that this is my, my actual mass is, I pick a different thickness. The same my actual my actual mass is here, right? So my data is distributed something like this. Not my data, sorry, my underlying true function is something like this, okay? And so the peak is this one. Okay? My point is that if I were to just guess the x value associated with this. That would be a pretty good guess, right? If I, let's say this is one, zero, one, two, three, four, right? This is E4. So then if I were to able to tell my code, guess, my guess for, for M is E4, then that's a pretty good guess. Then your, your minimization routine it's going to have to take many, many less steps to be able to to get at the to get at the actual optimal value. Okay, and so how do you how can you do this? You can say, for example, uh, let uh, let y max equal the maximum value of y s. Okay, so there is some array right here. And you're picking the maximum value and I'm associating, I'm calling that Y max, okay? Makes sense. But I'm not interested in the maximum value of the Y's. I'm interested in the X value that corresponds to the maximum that has the, who's, who's in the, his, who's uh, dependent variable will be the maximum. And so what you can do is called something called, I think you might have to make this a list, but I think it's index, You do, you call the list of variables, 
you do dot index and then y max. And what this returns is going to return the the index for which the maximum value lies. So let's say in this case, y is equal y s is equal to uh, we call this p zero p one p three p four and I skip two p three p four da 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 right and so the maximum value corresponds to p four. And what this function gives you is the index in this list corresponding to a maximum value. So it's going to give you uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. It's going to return back 4. OK? And so then your guess for E, or for M, sorry, M guess is just equal to xs, which is the fourth component, or the, in this case, not the fourth, but the fifth, because you're starting from zero. And so there's a good way for you to guess. Uh, for the constant case, this is even easier, uh, because you're, you're guessing that all your data are all the same value, right? And so, for constant example, you have data that looks essentially like this, right? Right? They're all kind of oscillating somewhat randomly around some underlying value. And the point is that any one of these is a good guess, right? They're all, you know, roughly the same distance away from your choice. And so one option is to say your, your constant guess, so I'm calling that the value that I want is C, so I'm going to call C guess my guess value. I'm just going to grab the first element. Oh, sorry, of Ys. So the first element, zero. Good guess. Or you can make it the average, which is what you're going to end up getting. Whatever, whatever you want. If you have a more complicated function, right, and there's no, there's not a, a linear uh, relationship between your parameters and your data, then um, you have to do a little bit more work, right? And here's an example you know, how you can start being clever about uh, the, you know, the, what values of M you can give. Also for gamma, you can, you, you know, the width of this is going to be related to gamma. Also the height of this is going to be related to gamma, right? You know, these pieces of information, you know, that uh, the maximum value, which you can say is this one, right? So P4, you know, we did this exercise, right? P4, uh, it's going to be pretty close to so your peak, you know, your maximum value and your amplitude, you can try to guess it, um, to be close to M over gamma, right? And so what is a good guess for, for this? Well, a good guess for gamma, uh, a good guess for, it's very hard to write, I think speak at the same time. A good guess for gamma is P4 divided by your guess for N. And so you can almost always, with a little bit of thought, um, fit, uh, get new, put information into your fitting routines so they converge faster. 
So I would always encourage you to, you know, these, these algorithms are remarkably powerful, but I would always encourage you to think a little bit critically um, about what you're trying to fit before writing your, your fitting routine. Okay, any other comments out there? Questions? Uh, Raul? Yeah, Juan? Yeah, well, I ha there are several of them, but I, I will... Well, uh, th there is one from uh, Deja Alexander from Chesapeake, Virginia. It's sort of basic, but I don't know if you can, if, if you want to leave it to the end, like a summary of the, of the, of the lecture. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. What do you mean? Uh, I will go with the question. I don't know if you already did. Okay. Can you explain what fitting exactly is? Like, what would be a definition of fitting? I mean, we have, I come to this because it's sort of the core of the lesson also. Sounds so good. If it's not clear. Do you wanna, you wanna take a stab, stab at it? Or yeah, I'm gonna take a stab at it myself. I mean, when you tell me about fitting, I think that you have a set of experimental data, let's say, and you want, you want to try to guess what is a good uh, equation uh, to describe those data. So basically, you what you call by fitting is that, uh, you assume or you suppose that you have a, uh, a theoretical behavior and you try to see if it's how good or not is that uh, assumption. And th there is a systematic way to do this that is called fit, uh, fitting. That's uh, how I would define it in simple words. Yeah, I think that's very good. Yeah. Um, in Spanish, the word is ajuste, no? Ajustar, sí. Ajustar, which is you ad adjust. So you're trying to, uh, which maybe, maybe that creates more confusion. But what you're trying to do is essentially is uh, you have some function, right? And here I'm showing that function. Here's my experimental data or data in general. It doesn't have to be experimental, right? Um, and what I'm trying to do is impose this form, this function on my data. So I have a continuous behavior of that data. But in addition, I can try to get some underlying parameters and underlying uh, coefficients that describe the behavior of that data. So sometimes those coefficients could be uh, interesting, okay? And so fitting is this routine where you're trying to fit some form, some function onto discrete data. The key point is that this data is discrete. In general, it can depend on some uh, independent parameters. In general, it can depend on mul multiple independent parameters, okay? Uh, and they can have complicated behaviors. And so you wanna try to have some underlying function that this describes all, uh, all the data that you want, you know, that you have. If you want to describe it in general, then uh, this procedure is called fitting. And, and one example that I drove home at the beginning, and let me maybe go back to it, is that this is remarkably important in discoveries within particle physics, and that's why we care about it so much. Um, and here I gave you some examples uh, where now you can see that here's some experimental data for some particle physics reaction and on the this little bump right here which can be zoomed in after subtracting some uh, some uh, curve you know some underlying uh, trends so you have here a flatter distribution um, this little bump right here led to the discovery, this is the discovery of the Higgs, which led to the Nobel Prize. And so, uh, you know, the this fit, this little seemingly simple fit was remarkably important in our discovery of the last missing particle uh, in the standard model. So fits are just ubiquitous and remarkably important in particle physics, as well as essentially any any physics. So yeah, perhaps you guys saw a talk by our collaborator, Boschel Tursik, uh, yeah, Tursik, who talked about the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, 
and their fitting was also remarkably important. You had some data and you had to uh, be able to, to re relate it to the original conditions that created um, the form that created the, the gravitational waves. Uh, in that case, it was the, the collapse of, uh, of uh, black holes, of uh, the merger of two black holes. And so you had to be able to do a fit to of what the experimental data and try to be able to relate it to the original conditions of that uh, gravitational wave. So it, it's, um, yeah, it's, these fitting is just gen generically important in, in physics. Did that answer the question, you think? Yes, I believe. Th okay. There are two more. Okay. There is one from Jesus Alberto Perez Vargas from Mexicali, Baja California, Mexico. Mm -hmm. I will read uh, I the question. It says, do you think I can understand 100% how this equation notation works? That is, understand how the fitting equation fits well? Basically, what I understand for the question, how do you know that the guess that you are doing uh, fits well the data or, or is a good guess? And the answer would be with that equation that you're putting there with the chi-square, no? But, uh, um, can you read the question again? Because maybe I'm misunderstanding the question and the connection to what you're saying. The question is a bit uh, long. It says, do you think I can understand 100% how this equation notation works, that is, on the sun. This, this how equation the, notation. How the fitting equation fits well. So I think that he refers to, how do you know that the guess that you are doing, the fit that you are doing, is a, good, is, a, is a good fit for the data. That is what more or less I infer from the question. Okay. Um, let, let, I mean, I'm, maybe, reading the question is they want to understand first the notation here and then how is this why does this do does the job that we want out of fitting right so fitting is a procedure by which we minimize the distance between our data and some function that we're trying to determine right and i had this this illustration of this example of the the data. So here's some some mimic of data, right? And here I gave you different the same function, but with just different values of m and gamma, right? And what I try to illustrate is that here I'm plotting not just the values of m and gamma. I'm not just writing the values of m and gamma, but I'm also evaluating the values of the chi squared, which is this function. And I think this function, it, it looks a little dense and it, it, it will become a lot clearer once you start playing with it. So if it doesn't make sense to you first, don't get discouraged, just use it and use it over again and then you'll start feeling more comfortable with it, okay? Uh, but this function, what you see is that it's giving me a value that is going from the red of 2,600 to the blue, which is 2,000 to uh the green which is 560 right so it's getting smaller and smaller as these lines get closer and closer to the data eventually i want this to be right on top of the data right i want to fit i want to i want to see which values uh for which values of m and gamma the line best fits the the data and so this is a measure that tells me what the distance is between uh, the the data. So if you, I mean, this is literally uh, sorry, I'm adjusting all my screens. Okay, there we go. Let me go back a little bit. Oh my god, this is going to take forever. Well, let's say that instead of this, uh, here you can see the distance between, um, so what you're comparing, let's say that I, com I make, I guess it looks something like this, okay? Okay, 
And so what I, what I would do is that the top line of the equation is measuring the distance from this point to this point, okay? So it's measuring this distance right here. And then measuring this distance right here. And then this distance. And this distance. And so forth and so forth, okay? So that's what, what is being plotted on the top. That's what's being determined on the top line. So the, for each point, I'm measuring the distance from my data and then my expected functional value at that corresponding uh, independent variable xi for the given choice of my parameters, okay? And so uh, this is right here. This distance is dn. Uh, here, this is going to be d. This is going to be d two, right? And let's finish them all. Okay. Here is d one, and here is d zero. So that's literally what I'm putting on the top. But I'm scaling this by the standard deviation of the data. Okay. And so why does that? Why am I doing that? Well, I'm doing that because if the data, if the individual data has a large error, and so here I'm assuming that this is a, um, the standard error, so it's telling me the error at that value, right? And so that the error is huge, then I'm going to give very little weight to that point. I'm going to say that point doesn't really matter much, okay? Because I'm saying I don't really know the functional value of that uh, at that one point of energy that well. It could be anywhere in that range, right? But if it's very tight, if the error is tiny, then it's telling me, oh, I certainly know that the, that my amplitude should be somewhere in this region, you know. And so I'm going to give some, I'm going to give a higher weight to the smaller value oop, of the standard deviation, okay? So the smaller the standard deviation is, uh, or the error is, then the more weight I'm going to give it. Uh, finally, why do I square? So I want to I want to do this over all points, but I square. Well, really, I should have done you know define the distance. So really, what I want is the absolute value, and so the square just takes care of that sign of the fact that, you know, in general, you know that you can have uh, displacements that are positive or, or negative. So here I'm just taking the distance squared. Um, and so this is just a standard definition of the, of the chi squared. So it's just a function that is taking you, that is taking your, your function as your underlying function that you're trying to fit this one right here as close as possible to the actual data point that you're determining. Does that clarify things a little bit, do you think? I think so, yes. Okay. We have a question. I'm seeing a question from Luke J from Ireland asking if we could do uh, a session on numerical integration or differential e equation solving. I wasn't planning on it. Um, I can think about it. Uh, uh, Raul. Yep. I pointed another question that uh, is actually, in my opinion, the hardest part of doing fitting. It's come from practicing Sarma from India, asking the following. How do you decide the type of function to be used for the fit, if it's not so obvious from the plot. It is theoretically predicted. Well. Yeah. Yeah, so that goes to my bullet point number zero for accelerators. But this works out for almost any experiment, I mean, any experiments in, in science, right? You should have some sort of theoretical uh, I think we have Echo. Juan, do you want to maybe mute? Sure. Yeah. Uh, 
for any experiment that you're going to perform, you should try to have some, well, in general, you have to have a hypothesis, but ideally it would be good to have some theoretical prediction. And this is, um, it, you, you should have some guidance of the mathematically of how your data uh, should behave according some, to some underlying principles. If you don't, then, uh, you know, it, it's going to be certainly harder to have some under, to explain which functional forms would describe your data best. That's always going to be a challenge. Uh, I can say from my own research, sometimes, so we, we try to develop uh, as robust as, you know, theoretical forms that would describe the kind of um, quote unquote data that we see from our numerical calculations. Uh, and we try to fit them to different functional forms that are allowed. Um, and this is in general a challenge even, you know, in our field. Uh, I can't speak of other fields out there, um, but I think this is in general a challenge to have some good idea of what functional form should describe some incoming data. And sometimes you have, you know, and this is a problem, right, in, uh, in the understanding the behavior of different economic measures and uh, in health and, you know, biological sciences, right? And to know which actual function, I mean, weather patterns, right? Like having to know which, uh, know which uh, actual functions would describe the behavior of more complicated systems. It's really hard to to obtain in general, and there there might not be exist a simple function out there, but um, a lot of times you can make some approximations in some regions and try to figure out which functions fit best the data. So, but yeah, this is a challenging point. But in this case, you have some simple data. I told you which functions to fit, uh, and I mean, in fact, you can, you know, if you want to do something more challenging, right? Here, I told you what in this example, I gave you a function, right? But you see that it's just linear in m pi. Well, why don't you try fitting a quadratic, right? And the question would be then, instead of assuming the, the first term is, is a linear, what happens if the first term is a quadratic in m pi? Do you get a better or worse behavior? Well, you can see the data and you know it's going to look worse. Uh, can you have something that is, you can, can you have a fit where you have three parameters, a, a constant, a linear term, and a quadratic term? Why not, right? So in general, you could play around with this and build some intuition. Oh, I see we got to go in a second. Uh, but, you know, you can try to make uh, mn, which is a function of m pi, equal to some constant, right? We already had some linear term uh, in m pi. Well, I'll put a quadratic term. And see, does that change your fit? Or try to fix this to zero. The first term is not there. You should get a worse chi squared, right? And so what you should see is does your chi squared change dramatically as you? You know, if you have different functional forms. And so the chi-squared is a good measure for that. It tells you, ah, if I get a reasonable chi-squared for using some type of fit, and I then modify that fit by introducing a new term and my chi-squared is not changing much, it's telling me that that new contribution, that new term in my expression is not uh, altering my fit much or, uh, or at all. And so you can, here you, you can pretty much see that any higher order terms in your polynomial are not going to make a big effect in your chi-squared. It will make an effect in extrapolating away from this data, right? But describing the data is not going to change it. So go ahead, answer that question for yourself. Okay, I think we're running out of time. Is there any other pressing questions that might take a minute? Uh, there was a nice question. Uh, might not take a minute. Uh, up to you. 
Uh, it's from okay. Nakul Shyam Kumar from Chennai, India. And they ask, can we use machine learning models to do the optimization for us? Ah, yeah, great question. Yeah, so machine learning is just a very, very sophisticated version of fitting. Um, and so, yep, uh, in fact, if you're interested in the topic, uh, which is an interesting one and an exciting one, um, let me point you to uh, a talk by a good friend of mine, uh, Emily Trewartha, or she, she goes by Amy Trewartha for short. Uh, she's a postdoc a scientist in uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And she will be talking in, in July 27th, so that's a couple of weeks from now, about using AI or in general machine learning techniques for reading COVID research papers. So analyzing data um, or analyzing papers that are coming uh, in regards to COVID. So if you want to learn about possible extensions and uh, you know how the types of tools that you're learning about now could then be adopted in later on. Um, as you become a better, better, better programmer, I would highly encourage you to check out her talk. Okay, so since we're getting close, let me just uh, point you to the next talk, which is going to be on an introduction of to engineering technologies uh, by uh, Professor Flory. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. And then, uh, as I already mentioned, we're going to have a trivia night. And as I said, there might still be some slots open. I'll, I'll have to check once I see my, my email. Uh, but if you're interested in participating, you can just check, send an email to pythonforphysics at odu.edu. And if there's any slots still open, I'll let you know. Uh, if not, you can still see the, you can see the session uh, here. And this is bound to be a lot of fun. So. Uh, stay tuned for that. Okay, so um, as always, go go ahead and write us, uh, send us some feedback, fill out the survey, send us whatever questions you may have on the Slack, and we'll try to get to them. Uh, next week, we're going to introduce a whole new topic, um, and we'll try to address whatever questions and outstanding problems you have as well, as always. Okay. All right, so have a good rest of your week and have a good weekend. All right.